There are many wonderful things that professional wrestling can mean for us, can represent, can bring to our lives. One of those is not having to deal with death. Now, death is an unfortunate but incredibly necessary part of life. Death is life's change agent, as Steve Jobs once said. It makes, takes out the old and makes way for the new, all of that. But you know, if you watch wrestling, you follow wrestling, you talk about wrestling on here, you write about wrestling, that part of what goes with the territory, unfortunately, is having to talk about wrestlers dying. And in particular, wrestlers dying, passing away before it seems like their time has really come. It's an all too familiar scenario, all too familiar situation. You know, I can't sit there and go through the list of the names because we'll be here for days. But certainly earlier this week, you know, with some very sad, sudden, kind of shocking news, uh, to find out that Scott Hall had had three heart attacks as apparently is part of a problem with a hip surgery and a reaction blood clot breaking loose. And he ended up being on life support and the decision was made to yank him from life support earlier in the week. So Scott Hall passes away, I believe, at the age of 63. And what's crazy about it is if you had said 10 years ago, let's say, that Scott Hall had passed away at the age of 53, it probably would have been less surprising and less shocking as him passing away now. But more on that in a moment. When you talk about Scott Hall, you are talking about to me, beyond question, one of the absolutely coolest cats, coolest characters, coolest performers, versatile performers in the history of professional wrestling. This is not hyperbole as it sometimes can be done to hype up somebody after they're dead because you don't want to speak badly about the dead or you want to honor their legacy as much as you can and as a result you kind of course correct. No, that's no lie. That's no BS. That is 100% true when you talk about Scott Hall. You have many people that will point to the fact of well, it's crazy he was never WWF world champion, WWE world champion, never WCW world champion. And you're right, he never was. And in some ways, that's a shame. But in some ways, does it matter? Like, does it really matter? He was never world champion. But there is no question he is one of the most influential professional wrestlers or sports entertainers, whatever label you want to put on it, Scott Hall is one of the most influential people over the past 30 years. Like, we have to be able to agree with that, I would think. I mean, this is a man that came in and dramatically helped change the business. And he was no small part in that. So world championship is nice, I'm sure, especially with the money that went along with it. But it's not like Scott Hall didn't make a significant amount of money. It's not like Scott Hall wasn't a significant integral player in the Monday Night Wars. It's not like Scott Hall isn't still an influence for multiple generations of wrestlers that are in the business now, coming up into the business, or may someday want to get involved in professional wrestling. That's got to mean way more than being a world champion. Because let's be really clear, if you look at probably 95% of the world champions in WWF slash WWF slash WWE, WCW, ECW, when you look at the world champions throughout the history, and if we want to get really crazy, we'll go back to the NWA days for sure. Scott Hall had more impact and more influence over the business than 90 or 95 percent of those champions. He did. He absolutely did. And certainly was cooler than the vast majority of them. That's why a guy that never was world champion is so universally revered as a wrestler, as an athlete, as an entertainer, as a performer 
two plus decades after his prime. That tells you something about the talent that was Scott Hall. Like when you go back and you look at Scott Hall early in his career, the AWA days and trying to really find his niche and really trying to find out who he could be in professional wrestling. Like this is a guy that paid his dues. This is a guy that obviously had a great look, great presence, but the shtick and the gimmick wasn't really there. And if he could ever find something to sink his teeth into, then by God, he was going to be something. And you could say that probably without a lot of wrestlers. And when he went to the WWF in late 1992, you know, Scott Hall joined the WWF at a time where they were really starting to get too far gone with the cartoonish, childish gimmicks. They were getting a little too ridiculous and they were really coming up with a lot of bad ideas. When you think about some of the ideas from that time and you're thinking about uh, Mantar and Bastion Booger and Spark Plug Holly and all these other like just god awful, horrendous, terrible gimmicks. And here he comes in with a character that on the surface was stupid and really shouldn't have worked. Reza Ramon. He's basically being a fucking parody of Tony Montana in Scarface. And he even talks about that, or he talked about that. When they were trying to figure out what to bring him in and how they were going to package him, and eventually Scott Hall got frustrated and he started talking in the Tony Montana voice. And you know Vince McMahon, he's like, I love it! And that's how the Razor Ramon character came to be. Razor Ramon as a character is so great that to this day, you probably still have a number of people that think that Scott Hall was Latino or Cuban or Mexican or something, Hispanic, what have you. They don't think of him as a Caucasoid. Like that's how immersed he became in the Razor Ramon character. That's how great he was at portraying the Razor Ramon character as both a heel and as a baby face. And that's a talent that not everybody has. Not everybody can be equally great as a baby face and a heel. They can't. You know, one of the notable examples of that would be a Ricky the Dragon Steamboat. Fantastic baby face. But he just doesn't work the same as a heel. Not everybody can be equally great on both sides of the character fence, and Razor Ramon could be. You know, when people want to talk about the legendary ladder match at WrestleMania 10, who's the real Intercontinental Champion, him and Shawn Michaels. And, and I almost resent that in a way because it was a great match. You know, it's still one of the 10 best WrestleMania matches of all time. Fight yourself on it. But it almost in a way diminishes Scott Hall. It diminishes the Razor Ramon character. It diminishes Scott Hall and the performer he was and the quality of performer that he was. I guess what a lot of people bring up is that one match and it's like, holy hell, this dude had way more than that in his resume and we're just talking about the WWF days. Like in the mid-90s, before he left to go to WCW in 96, bottom line is Razor Ramon was one of the few reasons to even watch WWF television and programming because it was not good. And he was one of the reasons. And to me, certainly was more entertaining overall as a performer at that time than a Shawn Michaels and a Bret Hart. Now, maybe you felt like as a company you could trust a Bret Hart and a Shawn Michaels more. I understand that, but... When you talk about pure entertainment value and you talk about the ability to work the crowd, get them to react and do very little, like there are a few better than Scott Hall. And then when you think to WCW and everybody talks about the NWO, everybody talks about Bash of the Beach 96 and when Hogan turned heel and they formed and you talk about when Kevin Nash came. But that whole angle started with Scott Hall randomly appearing on Nitro in 96. Like that was big. That was a seismic shift at the time. And part of the reason that whole angle worked was because Scott Hall was there first. You know who I am, but you don't know why I'm here. Like he was the perfect front guy for that. 
So the NWO, as much as you could say, it works so well because of the three main players, because of Hogan turning heel, and that's true. But that shit doesn't work if you don't have Scott Hall, period. And when you look at the MWO, and we could talk about flaws, and we could talk about maybe bad things it represented to the wrestling business, it is easy to overlook or overshadow or minimize the significantly positive impacts that the NWO and guys like Hall and Nash had on the business. You could say, well, eventually the pay scales got out of whack. Well, that also means a lot of wrestlers made better livings because of these guys. Wrestling went mainstream in a way that hadn't been since the mid 80s in on Vince's WWF. And even then it permeated pop culture in, to an entirely different level. To this day, you've still got people talking about too sweet. And I'm not just talking about the nerds in wrestling that are trying to rip off and imitate the NWO. I'm talking about people still talk about Too Sweet. And they will still debate to this day. I used to watch wrestling. And were you red and white? Or were you Wolfpack? And all this other shit. Like you had the NWO appearing on the Jay Leno show. You had Rodzilla coming in and working with Hogan. Holy Christ. You had halftime heat, empty arena match, Rock and Mankind in 99, get like eight and a half, nine million viewers on MTV. Like, that's how cool wrestling was. And at the forerunner, at the fore, at the front part of all of that movement was Scott Hall. Like, he comes into WCW and he stops being the, the cartoonish character Reza Ramon and he becomes Scott Hall. One of the legitimately coolest motherfuckers in professional wrestling history. Now, if you think about people you would want to have a beer with, which is probably part of the problem anyway, uh, Scott Hall would be near the top of that list for most everybody, I would think. Like, the dude just had, when you talk about five tool talents, he had the five tools. This was a guy that was at the forefront of changing the business to where it got less cartoony and it got more reality based, it got more legit. Like we talk about the genius of the NWO, the genius of the NWO, if we want to really go there, is the fact that it was led by three white guys and it was able to permeate into both white and black cultures. It had both a mafia mentality and a street gang mentality, it had all of that. And it was absolutely wonderful and brilliant. And Scott Hall was part of a group that led to WCW reigning supreme in the Monday Night Ratings War for over a year and a half. That's no small feat. And to this day, we still look back fondly on the days of the NWO. We still look back fondly to, at the Outsiders. And, you know, no disrespect to Kevin Nash, who himself had plenty of cool factor. Plenty of cool factor. But he would tell you, like, Scott Hall is an entirely different level of cool. He absolutely was. And it's sad to have to talk about him in the past tense. It really is. It really is. And as great as Scott Hall was, and as cool as he was as a character and a performer, what I talked about earlier in the video and the fact of I'm more shocked and more surprised that here in 2022, I'm doing this video about Scott Hall than if I was doing it in 2012. That is true. And it comes to me down to this simple point is that the greatest victory that Scott Hall had, the best performance that he had over the past decade of his life, or last decade of his life, was that he finally was able to clean up some of his demons. He was finally willing to to tackle that. He had battled against it for years and this battle was substance abuse and alcohol and drugs. Like it ruined his career. There's no question about it. You know, you go back to, this is a guy that was working with Stone Cold in WrestleMania 18 in 2002 and then he was gone soon after. He should have had more run in him. And yeah, he would appear in other places like TNA and so forth, but you know what I mean? Like it, it wasn't the same at that point. It got to the point where it's kind of sad and tragic. But what wasn't sad and tragic is that in the last years of his life, 
He seemed to finally get it. He seemed to finally want to take on the responsibility of cleaning up his act, to take on the responsibility of taking ownership for his problems and taking ownership for the fact that the only person that's going to be able to make them better is him. And sure, you're going to need help and support along the way. And God bless somebody like a DDP being there to help out his old friend. The diamond stud is getting help. But the reality is, is that when I think back to Scott Hall and his career, his life and his legacy, I look back at a wonderful wrestling career that was cut short because of his own failings and shortcomings in terms of his battles with addiction that he was losing. And how it sure seemed like in the last few years of his life, Scott Hall finally committed himself to beating those demons. Like in some ways, that's an inspirational story. And sure, it absolutely positively sucks that I'm having to come on here and talk about Scott Hall being dead at the age of, what, 63? I'd love to see him live for another 10, 15, 20 years. But when you really look at somebody like Scott Hall and you say, did he live a life? You're goddamn right he lived a life. He got every bit out of himself he possibly could in that 63 years. On all of the spectrums, on the positive and on the not so positive. Like he ran the gamut. But goddamn it, the way he lived his life the last few years, I think can serve as a bit of inspiration for anybody that is battling demons and battling against addiction, battling with substance abuse problems. And saying that, you know, it's one thing to have the problem. You have to acknowledge that you truly have a problem. But more importantly, you have to want to finally do something about it to make it stop. It will always be a fight. It will always be a battle. Nobody ever said life was easy. And eventually Scott Hall got to the point where he had tried at different points in time to do rehab and everything like that. But again, you could put forth an arbitrary effort. But if you're not truly, fully, completely committed, it's not going to happen. But you could clearly tell in the last several years of his life, like he cleaned up his act, he looked better in his late 50s, early 60s than to some degree he did in his early and mid 40s. Like that speaks to like just the type of transformation that the bad guy made. And I think as much as anything else, that's a wonderful legacy to have. A wonderful on-screen, in-ring wrestling legacy I mean, when you think about coolest wrestlers of our lifetime, and now I'll be 41 in a couple of days. When I think about cool, when you really think about coolest wrestlers of my lifetime, at least, Scott Hall's probably on that Mount Rushmore. No, there is no probably. He is on that Mount Rushmore. Like in terms of true cool factor, it's him. It's probably The Rock, Austin, and then maybe like Crow Sting. And you say, well, what about a Hogan or a Taker? They were cool, but I don't know if they were that cool. You know what I mean? Like the shit that those four guys did that I just mentioned, Crow Sting, Austin, Rock, Scott Hall, that holds up to this day and holds up incredibly well. Now, you can debate some of the others. Here's what I know. Is that when you talk about machismo and presence and just fucking masculine cool factor, Scott Hall had it in abundance. The guys wanted to be like him. The women wanted to do him. And if you were a guy, you wouldn't have been so ashamed if Scott Hall had done your lady. Who could blame you? And his fucking Razor Ramon. You would be proud to cuck for that. Don't lie. But that dude, Scott Hall, to me, when I think about lasting legacy, I look at the wrestling business now, and I don't want to make this like an indictment of the wrestling business now, but it could use more Scott Halls. And it's not just about size. Like, obviously, he's a big, legit-looking dude. But presence, charisma, understanding how to work, understanding how to be a character, understanding how to be a performer understanding how to get a huge reaction by doing very little. The whole, you're going to go out there and flump, flip and bump around for 15 minutes, I'm going to go get a headlock and get the bigger reaction. And that's the type of power that Scott Hall had as a worker. Like, that's working right there. So yeah, it sucks to talk about this too because you think about, 
like a lot of the wrestlers, even the big, huge names over the past several years, like the, the Dusties and the Warriors and the Pipers, you know, the reality is, is their bigger time was in the 80s. Talking about Scott Hall now, you know, this is somebody that the height of his career was the mid 90s, the late 90s. So, yeah, it sucks to kind of think about that, too. So when you think about key figures in the Monday Night Wars, and he's not the first, obviously, to pass, so Owen Hart back in the day, and there's been others, but he's certainly one of the most notable. So, hey, y'all. The bad times don't last, but bad guys do, right? Isn't that what he said in his Hall of Fame speech? Something to that effect, I might have butchered it, and I'm sorry if I did. But Scott Hall is truly a legendary wrestler, world championships or not. In fact, it speaks to his legacy, it speaks to his greatness, that he was never world champion. And so many people look back on his career so fondly because he was, beyond question, one of the most influential and certainly, arguably, the coolest wrestlers of his time. 